Welcome to Indoctrination, a weekly conversation series about protecting yourself from systems of control. I'm your host, Rachel Bernstein. Hi, everyone. Before I introduce the wonderful guests for today, I wanted to mention a couple of things. One is that I am so excited on behalf of my team and of myself to be able to announce that we have just surpassed 2 million streams. Actually, 1 million just in the last year alone of the 2 million streams. Thank you to the powerful, powerful guests, to my talented team, and to the listeners all over the world. And I mean all over the world. And I'm going to be talking more about where people are listening all over the world and kind of doing a bit more of a deep dive into that and why they might be listening in different parts of the world, but also in different parts of the United States. So stay tuned for that next time. I also wanted to mention that while we have asked people to do reviews and post five stars if they're feeling the show deserves five stars, and there's someone who gave us a review with less than five stars because she was saying that she felt that my coverage of teen treatment programs was biased, basically and that I needed to be careful to not lump them all into the same category as being dangerous, and that some are healthy and some are good. And so she gave the whole podcast a kind of a lower star review because of that. So I want to make sure to be very clear if I haven't, and I, I feel like I've said this, but when I'm mentioning a particular issue, a particular organization, I'm talking about that organization. I'm not saying every program that works with teenagers is bad. I'm not saying every residential program that works with teenagers is bad. I've never said that in my life because it's just not true. I'm going to highlight where there are issues. I'm going to highlight the fact that there isn't oversight. I'm going to highlight the fact that there isn't regulation to oversee all of the programs so that they interact with teenagers in a healthy way, and that someone is watching what's going on. That's just not the case. No matter how much I wish it were different, and no matter how much this listener wishes it were different, I'm sure, it is just not the case yet. I'm hoping new legislation will make sure that there's oversight to make sure that it is safe. I know that it's a difficult population to work with at times, but I also know, and I've met many people who are really okay and were treated like they were difficult and were mistreated. And then a lot of people who have issues from their time in these programs and trauma from their times in these programs. So I've never said that all of something is bad. Part of the reason for the show is being able to highlight what makes something dangerous, whether it's a person or an organization or a therapist or a pastor or anyone how you can detect it, what you need to look for, and how to understand why after you've had an experience there, you might be feeling traumatized to kind of have a better sense of what causes that in certain situations. So I wanted to make sure that that's clear. My point is never to defame all of something. Now, for today, we have two wonderful women on the show, Nikita Lambert and Asha Glenn. They bring up such an interesting issue of a certain pattern of conditioning leading to another pattern of conditioning. And we're going to get into what I'm talking about because it's so interesting. They are former members of the International Churches of Christ Both having grown up with narcissistic mothers, they've been gaslit, shamed, and silenced their whole lives by the people closest to them, while thriving academically and professionally. A true paradox. They're now making it their mission to speak out against psychological, emotional, and spiritual abuse in the hopes of providing a safe space for others to speak out about their own experiences and learn what it means to claim their power and autonomy. 
It was great to talk to them, and I hope to talk to them again at some point soon. Here are Nikita and Asha. It is my pleasure to have Asha Glenn and Nikita Lambert with me today. It's been something I've been looking forward to. These are the kinds of conversations that I truly look forward to for so many reasons. First of all, I get to meet new people who are out there talking about this, who are a presence on YouTube, who want to be able to educate people, who want to be able to use their own personal experiences, familial, cultic and also what you've come to learn about religious trauma to help the public, which is really quite amazing. There's so many different subjects for us to cover. I'd love you to start just by introducing yourself. So Asha, can you start? Hello, I am Asha Glenn. I am an educator and I was a member of the ICOC, also known as International Churches of Christ, for 21 years. Nikita and I are friends. We recently started a kind of series talking about ICOC on YouTube. And so we just really want to share a story and um, warn people about the dangers of coercive high control groups. Wonderful. That's wonderful. Okay, good, good. I'm so glad that you're here. And so go ahead, Nikita. Thank you so much, Rachel, for having us on. But I was in the ICOC for maybe like 13 and a half years. I joined when I was a freshman in college, which if you're familiar with this group, you know that they prey on young college students. And I just grew into adulthood and motherhood and through my career in this organization. And um, Asha and I both have narcissistic mothers. And so as we became closer as friends, we realized that we had a lot of shared experiences, both with our upbringing, but also when it came to the church. And we were very fortunate to be able to lean on each other and a small group of friends to help in the process as we found our way out of the group. And so now we just like to reach out and share the gift of validation and education with everyone surrounding the dangers of this group and what it's like to leave and regain autonomy because unfortunately, when you leave this group and other high control groups, you are almost exiled yeah. and your your whole community has been in that organization. And so we were very fortunate to have each other. Yeah. And so we just want to provide validation and comfort for other people who left and we're not as fortunate to have that community. Mm, it's a beautiful thing. And it's so good to have friends with you through this process. I'm sure that you've leaned on each other and given each other strength and insight and just having that, oh yeah, that happened to me also moments. Yeah. Or I can totally relate, you know, because I, I think also having a narcissistic parent, there are certain things that are kind of nuanced. Oh yeah. That, right. You're like, oh, why do I have an issue with that? And why am I wondering about this about myself? And where did that come from? And, you know, that's a, it's a very important thing to have people who can relate. Yeah. For undergrad, I went to Boston University and was there in the 80s. And the Boston movement, yes, (laughs) the ICOC as it started out with Kip McKean, was very big, was very big on campus. And uh, if I can say thank you at all to the group, it's to lighting a fire under me to do this work because they were my kind of my first exposure to the fact that people could work really hard to get to a college campus, to get to wanting to start their lives, whether it's in college or not, but just around that age, and then be abducted, basically. And I remember going to Dean Thornburg, who was the dean of Marsh Chapel, and that was on campus. And it's actually where uh, Martin Luther King Jr. had studied. And I said, have you heard of this group? I see busloads of kids leaving to go outside the dorms to weekends. And I asked them where they're going because I had already grown up with cult education in my family. And I said, they don't know where they're going. And I asked them, where are you going? Oh, we're going away. That's not a place. Away is not a place. (laughs) And 
do you know when you're going to, well, we're going to be back on Sunday. It's okay. It's a church group. And then I saw their front names that they used on campus, Campus Advance and Alpha Omega and all these other names that they used at the time to get under the radar where the school was giving them rooms to meet in. And I remember meeting with someone uh, with Dean Thornburg, and she said that she was trying to do what she could to educate people in Boston at the time. Because she could tell it was a cult when she got involved. She just went to the the meetings and to the Bible talks. And then she said she couldn't come one week because she had finals and she was paying her own way. If she didn't get good grades, she wasn't going to be able to stay in school. And they said, if you don't come to the meeting, you're making a choice, is what they said to her, between getting good grades and having a relationship with God. And this is on a college campus where the school is giving them a room to meet in and basically credence, you know, and good PR, which was unbelievable. So I'm sure you know all these stories, but there was these were these eye-opening moments for me and, you know, a lot of those moments that really propelled me to want to do this work as I thought, how dare they put people, back them into this corner where they have to give up their life. So tell me, I would love to hear about some of these things that happened to you. And then, of course, we'll go back to talking about moms and everything else. But let's start with some of those times that you were probably feeling boxed into a corner. Boxed into a corner is a really great way to describe what it feels like. You are trained to see the Bible as your instructional guide and Um, What you don't realize is that certain scriptures and the way you even read the Bible is being painted with a certain brush, with a certain lens that always leads back to the basics of what this organization believes. And so much of what this organization believes is full devotion to them. So many of the Bible studies ultimately lead you into this idea that there is one church, one baptism, one Christ, right? They read that scripture in Ephesians and they are pointing to themselves as the only church. And then they teach you that we as the church, the only church is Christ's bride. We are his body. And to be connected to him, you have to be connected to us. So if you wonder why someone would be willing to sacrifice their whole college education for this group, that's why. I am a part of this body. If I pull myself away, I'm literally not connected to God anymore. I'm not connected to Christ or I'm hurting the body of Christ in some way. And for me, all of that was said. And I remember saying before, at one point, I really need to study. (laughs) I really need to go home and study. And the scripture that was always used to prevent me from feeling like I needed to do any of that was, you should put the kingdom of God first and all these things will be given to you. And it was like, don't you understand that if you put God first, he'll give you the right answers on your test. That was actually said to me by the person who was my discipler at the time. We can talk all about that too, but your discipler is like your, the person who tells you what to do. You go to them and they guide you. And so you are literally shamed for doing anything that appears that you're not putting the kingdom of God first. And you learn very quickly that their idea of the kingdom is synonymous with them. The church, if something is going on in this group and you choose to do something else, you're not seeking God. You are not putting the kingdom first. So what you said just resonated with me so clearly. And you are, you're literally boxed in and you are under the impression. So I didn't mention it either. I was converted at 18 years old, straight out of high school, a freshman on campus. And then with the background I had with narcissism and really not knowing who I am, being used to having an authority figure control everything I do, (laughs) right? I was very susceptible to this group. So you really do believe that there are two choices, either do what's right and put God first, or you're literally disobeying and disappointing God. So boxed in. Absolutely. Mm. I would like to add that for anyone who's not familiar with this group or even for us now, hindsight is 2020. These types of things sound 
wild that we would believe, but they do a good job grooming you. I know Asha mentioned the Bible study series, and that's like the series of studies that they sit you down with and basically help you to quote unquote, see how your life matches up with the Bible in any way that it's not in line, we can work and help to get you to align it with God's word. And one of the scriptures that they like to use very early on is when someone asks Jesus, will only a few be saved? And so Jesus doesn't say yes or no, but he goes on to say something to the effect of you make every effort to enter through the narrow gate because wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, but narrow is the road that leads to life and only a few find it. They basically use that to isolate you from everyone in your life. Any praying grandmother, any trusted pastor or advisor, anyone else. And they just let you see, oh, well, Jesus said very few will make it. There are not a lot of people who are willing to make every effort and deny themselves and be radical to this level. This is what devotion to Christ look like. Are you going to put the kingdom of God first, like Asha said? And so anytime you think that something may be too extreme, they take you back to, well, wide is the road, narrow is the road to heaven, or these other kind of really extreme statement to center you into, we're the true disciples. We, we see the word of God and we put it into practice. If, if you don't want to do these things, I mean, this is what it says right here. Your issue is not with me. It's with God because this is God's word. Absolutely. And so we've either had these things said to us mm-hmm. or have been instructed to say them to others as we would try to bring them in the group and they may have certain rebuttals. And you got to understand that when you are studying the Bible with this group, the goal is to get you to stop believing that you really have any true relationship with God. The goal is to strip you of what you think and then tell you what is true, quote unquote. And so your whole idea of what it is to be in a relationship with God is being completely torn apart and built back up and you don't realize it. So a big part of the scripture, like even that Nikita just shared, comes from the study uh, discipleship. And the point of that study is to teach what a disciple is and then to prove to you that you never were one. So you get broken down step by step very cleverly. And it puts this fear in you and this desperation in you to get right with God. So imagine you have this urgency in you now and you want to get right with God. You know, you stop thinking kind of clearly and logically. And especially when you are still practically a teenager, I'm sure it has been talked about on the show, but a lot of these groups target college students because our brains aren't fully developed, but we are idealistic and open, you know, we, and we want something different for ourselves. So we're like the perfect target. Right. You know, how interesting. I'm writing down some notes here because there's so much of what you're saying that I see over and over again in so many of these groups and they just look different, you know, and might be called different things, but the techniques are so similar. And so this idea, first of all, about not ever having been like you were never a disciple, you were never right with God. How do they know? But based on their guidelines for what that means. And so it, kind of brings in this idea of reciprocity, like here, now you have the chance finally through them. And then you're going to want to give back or show you're devoted to them for giving you this gift, even though you're always had it. Yeah. You know, I was talking on the podcast with this woman, Felicia Rosario, who is in this Sarah Lawrence cult, where the person in charge said that he was going to give them a chance to get back on track with their life. But he's the one who took them off track. He was going to gift them with his help to get them back on track. And you just wonder, people who keep messing with your history, with history in general, not just yours, but history in general, and then kind of own your happiness, your safety, and then we'll say, here, here's my gift to you. It's so manipulative. 
But it's especially trippy later on when you realize they actually don't have the answer. They don't have the way for me to have a relationship with God. That must be very hard when you get to that point when you realize that. Especially when you've been around as long as Asha and I have been. Like you grow out of your teens. You have your first legal dream. You maybe date and get engaged and married. You have children. Maybe you're buying your first home. I lost my mom in this group. I started my career while here. Like just so many life stages. And then just to kind of have your whole worldview that was constructed to be taken away. It's really disorienting. And then to realize I was so much happier before you guys. Like you you start to realize, I know Asha and I were talking recently. If we look at the friends we had, we look at the boyfriends we had, no shade to our husbands at all, but the life and the things that we were choosing and the people we chose to surround ourselves with, even if at that young age, it's like we knew what we valued. We knew what traits we wanted. We knew where we wanted to be, what we wanted to do. And so even recently, uh, as I've been making different decisions and expressing, I want to do this. I want to go here. I got my nose pierced back in October of 2022. And I'm thinking of maybe getting my eyebrow pierced and, you know, different hobbies. And my husband said, I just feel like you've presented as very conservative for these last eight years that we've been married. He said, I don't, I don't mind. This is fun, but I just feel like, who is this person? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, You know, I wanted an eyebrow piercing when I went away to college or I always liked this music or I always liked these kinds of clothes, just different things like that. And it's like, I'm not necessarily a new person. I'm reconnecting with the original person. Oh, yeah. Beautifully said, right? I was going to say that you can take on a certain outward persona and most people have them. They talk about that when they've gotten involved in a, in a cultic system. It's talking about disorienting that, that they sometimes don't even recognize themselves. They know they're holding back. They know they are doing the thing and acting the way that's going to please the people around them because they feel like they have to. And then they have to kind of reemerge and find a way to do that. And luckily you're around people and you have a spouse who's like, cool, whatever. Because really it's about you just exercising your freedom to be you. You haven't changed. You now get to be fully you, which is a lovely thing. But it's, yeah, it's very hard to put yourself on the shelf in that way for however long. And no, also then the group only accepted you for that persona, not for you. Asha, were you going to talk about that? Yeah, I was going to say, so I spent, my entire adult life trying to be what this organization wanted me to be. You are pretty much taught that these things that are naturally you, your personality are the very things you need to deny and die to. You have to die to yourself. That is ingrained in us. So when you start to push back and say, this is what I like, this is what I want to do. Well, you know, you have to deny yourself. You actually have to die to yourself so that Christ may live in you. So you receive this message repeatedly. The old has gone, the new has come. Yes. When you emerge from the waters of baptism, you died with Christ's burial and you resurrected new and you're not you anymore. Sometimes people get baptized. It's really creepy, but sometimes when people get baptized and they get lowered into the water, people in the crowd will say, bye, Asha. Yes. And we thought this was so great. We thought it was it was so great to become completely empty and look to these leaders of this organization to tell us who to be because that's what denying yourself is. So I had this pretty much when I woke up out of this trance, it was like I was pretty much taught that my whole personality was a sin. To this day, I still have a hard time just acknowledging things I want to do. And doing them because there's something, it's a resistance inside of me that says you can't do that. It's very much like a narcissistic system where the goalpost is always moving in general. And I really mean this, this organization is threatened in period by you having your autonomy. So anytime anybody comes across confident, making a decision on their own, knowing what they want and 
thinking something is okay without getting their permission, it's bad. Because I was always trying to figure it out, right? It's like, what, what is the rule? You know, one second I'm being told, you're doing great. The next second, it's like, we need to talk to you. Your pride, you're being prideful, you're arrogant. I'm like, I didn't do anything. And they're like, see, that's your pride. You don't see what we see. And you never know when it's going to come. But now I really feel like it comes from, do you think that it's okay for you to make decisions without us saying it's okay? That issue. In a nutshell, at the very bare bones of this organization, they want ultimate control over your decision making. And so that's the fear. It's just been put in me that I'm prideful. I'm arrogant. Something bad is going to happen to me. <laughs> also selfish. And I'm so oh, selfish was one that was used against me. Um, that, that was a really hard one because that's also what I was told as a child over and over again. I'm wondering about just the die to yourself. I mean, yeah, woo, that goes right through you when you hear about that. And so then what did you think? I mean, you know, for you, Nikita, what were you told that you had to change about yourself in order to be right with God? It all goes back to initially the Bible study. So especially because of having a narcissistic mom, what's the standard was laid out. I got it. I fell right in line. It's like, oh, I know the rules. And I'm an older sibling as well. So I'm like, oh, you've told me the rules? Watch me. I will even add some to the list <laughs> and follow those too. So initially, definitely selfish ambition. There are several passages in the Bible that have what this organization calls sin lists. And when you get to the sin Bible study, they go over all these lists with you and they make you basically confess every flaw you have. And so I've always been very ambitious. I've always been a leader since like middle school. I was on top of any club you could think of, basically. And so then in college, I was in a program to get my MBA in five years. They always said of me after I had joined the church that I was great. I was great studying the Bible. Basically, I was very compliant and um, moldable. The only issue was they had trouble scheduling with me because I had so many meetings with so many extracurriculars, which I let, I let them all go. And in one of the sin lists, they talk about selfish ambition. And so basically, are you trying to build a life for yourself or a life for the kingdom of God? And so coming from an emotionally, verbally, psychologically abusive household where I found out in my adulthood, we were not lacking money, but my mother made it seem that we were always lacking money. So my sister and I would not ask for things. I have this drive to want to create a better life for myself, right? And I'm going to do that in college. But apparently me wanting to take the steps to create that life for me is very selfish. And then also there's a scripture that talks about um, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his very soul? So then at that, I was like, oh, why would I want all this money? Why would I want a great job if it means I'm going to go to hell? <laughs> like, and yeah. th this is the way that they're communicating it yes. and that I am prideful and I am self-important uh, and I need to learn how to look to a man for leadership. Um, because even in the all the ministries, the men lead the groups, the Bible talks, and the women are helpers. And they talk about how helper in the Bible is really, it's, it's this life-saving help. Like if the woman doesn't come to aid, the man will die. It's used to describe God coming to help the Israelites in war. Right. But in practice, when I say, hey, bro, I think there are some flaws in this plan. Let's consider the rebuttal is, you don't trust my leadership. You're critical of me. I'm going to go ask the leader. And then the leaders will say, well, if no one's really going to get hurt, you should just support his vision. Like, okay. So basically just all my dreams, all my hopes, all of my intelligence, leadership capabilities, critical thinking skills, I had to put to the side to make disciples and make young men feel powerful, like powerful soldiers in the army of the Lord, while I 
facilitated people bringing snacks to Bible talk. And then also I had to leave a romantic relationship as well. And that was very hard. That was very challenging. Right. Yeah. Asha, what, what do you have to say about that? Oh, yeah. (laughs) I was thinking also a big part of this whole process is the weaponization of acceptance. Because the part I think we're leaving out is this group is really, really good at love bombing. Mm -hmm. You feel like, especially coming from the childhoods that we've had, you feel like you have found a dream come true. I have finally found people who really love me, who are kind to me, who care about my soul. Like they are my family. After every Bible study, people are saying, I love you. You know, and that's not something I'm hearing a lot growing up. I'm not being treated so nice. These people appear to have these beautiful families. You know, my family was very broken. So you are drawn into this. And so you asked a little earlier, like, what what, what were we afraid of, you know, that would be taken from us? It was that acceptance. You saw it immediately. You don't do what I say. You don't do things the way that we think you should do them. You don't get approval from us first before you make decisions. You can do that, but you will see, you will feel the coldness. Now you're on the struggling list. Now you're not being invited to the leaders meetings. Now we're actually building up this sister because she's so amazing and you don't, you don't feel it. You don't, you don't know it's happening. You just feel it. Like why all of a sudden you're not talking to me anymore. All of a sudden you were building me up, raising me up to lead this Bible talk at this campus ministry. And then I find this actually happened to me. I was being raised up (laughs) to lead the campus ministry. And um, we were studying the Bible with a girl, me and the campus ministry leader at the time. And the girl wasn't grasping things the way the leader wanted her to. And I wasn't being pushy enough to get this girl to get it. And she was kind of testing me at that time. And when it was over, she just laid me out, told me how I didn't do anything right. And I was like, okay, I'll work on it. But the next thing I had heard was someone else is leading now. It would happen like that. You're like, oh my gosh. They wouldn't talk to you, wouldn't officially let you know, but they would announce it in front of the group. This person is leading campus ministry. And you have to sit there and take it. Like I've been rejected. So it's all this rejection for not doing things right. And you just want that acceptance back and you are clawing at it. You are, you're like, I want it back. What happened? So, and you really, it's the trauma bond that they create. And you're like trying again, trying again, trying again. Yeah, no, it's really, really powerful. I think that's also why so many of these groups will make you feel disconnected from people outside, from the rest of the world, distrustful or or greater than or less than or whatever it is, but you don't feel like a part of things anymore. So that you have to cling to these people because they're what you have or they're what you have left. Yes. It's like an abusive relationship where they separate you from your friends and family, and then you're completely dependent upon them. And now you feel like I can't go back. I've rejected all these other people. I've turned my backs on them. I've told all of them they're not Christians anymore. You're all I have left now. Yeah, right. And then you can't be out of favor with them because then you'll have nobody. Nobody. Do you know it's very rare what we had coming out of this organization? having a group that were supporting each other as we did this is so rare. When you leave this group, you are shunned. (laughs) You are isolated. You are treated like something is wrong with you. And that's probably what kept me in for 10 years longer than I should have been was that rejection that I knew I would experience. It is a miracle (laughs) that I got to deconstruct and leave with a group of friends. I don't know. I personally don't know that it's something I would have been able to do um, without the support I had. You're absolutely right. Yeah. We've actually, since starting our series on YouTube, received several messages where people say, I'm thinking of maybe leaving, but I'm just really afraid that if I leave, I'll have nothing. Yep. And that is 
so heartbreaking. Yes. I was like some of uh, my friends, you know, years while still being a part of this, you know, group a couple of years ago would joke about this. Like, man, we should leave, but then we'll lose all of our friends. It be, you know, it's something you just know is going to happen. And on top of people messaging and saying, I just don't know what to do. I'm scared. I'm going to lose everything. We've had people who did lose everything message us and say, I left five, 10, 20 years ago. And seeing this video has validated me so much. I just tried to stuff it and move on with my life. But I knew something happened to me here. And you all being open about this has helped me so much. It's given me so much clarity of what's happened to me. And it's been validating and it's, it's overwhelming. And we, we knew it. We knew that this is what people experience. But to have people tell us this. I was broken when I left. I wish I had people to talk to, but I had no one. And it's devastating. Uh, It is so devastating. And it's so cruel for a group to do this to people. So cruel to leave them with what they think is nothing and no one. I mean, can you imagine? Wow. And I think the extra cruel thing, and I know Ash and I have touched on this in a couple of the videos, is that when you join, because of the love bombing and then also the grooming where they condition you to think that this is your real family, um, when they talk about this is the family of Christ, we are the body, I need you, you need me. And then there's a scripture where, you know, Mary wants to see Jesus and Jesus says, well, who are my my mother and father and brother and sister. It's those who do the will of Christ. Yes. Um, so they, they're literally tell it's textbook cult. You can't trust your family. We are your family. And so even as assured as I am and validated as I am with the group, even just recently, uh, my husband had a conversation with one of the leaders in the church who was very present while I was studying the Bible and back in my college days. And, you know, we were, I saw him as a big brother. We haven't talked and I I know where his mind is. He's very, very deep in it. Um, I'm not necessarily looking for validation from him, nor do I expect it. But when my husband shared what he said about, um, no, I haven't watched the videos. I don't, I, why would she post those videos? Some of the things she's saying, they're not true or just these different things and thinking, I was convinced I would have gone to the grave thinking this man was my brother. And to hear that I am hurt, I have been hurt. I have been devastated. I have been violated. I feel in certain ways, my life has been taken to shambles. Mm -hmm. You didn't call to reach out when I left two years ago. You didn't say, hey, I heard you're thinking this. What happened? What's going on? And then now I put a video out and you are so threatened by me exposing what's going on that you would rather dismiss me and slander me than to check on me who I, you had convinced you loved me with the love of the Lord. You loved me so much that I should leave my biological family because they actually don't even understand the the real love. How could they love if they are not connected to Jesus? I love you in ways they never could. But this is how you respond when I am being vulnerable and sharing my my wounds with the world. You have not texted me. You have not asked to hear my perspective. You just feel so confident and smug to say those videos are dis- destructive and and they don't seem true. And so... That, that's the kind of organization that this is, that we we love you and we accept you and we want you to leave everything you've ever known. But then when you step out of line, like Asha said, we will disown you and slander you. Right, right. It's incredible. You know, I, I think uh, going back to this idea of a sin list and for a while it was called a sin study. It was gone through different names. Oh, you do a sin list as part of the sin study. Yeah. Oh, got it. <laughs> got it. Got it. Okay. Right. So I remember talking to a number of people who did this and they would sit down and they had been kind of goody goodies as they said, and there wasn't a lot that they had to put on this list like to add to it. And they were encouraged to kind of do that and disclose things about themselves. There wasn't really a lot. And so then it was, well, have you ever had a thought 
not have you done something, have you ever had a thought that was anything like jealous or something, coveting something, which is everybody in the world. And then there was the experience of them feeling like unless they thought of more things to add, they were disappointing the person doing it with them. Like they had to keep coming up with things and some kind of made up stories or exaggerated stories because they were getting this feedback. Like they were, this person was going to be disappointed with them that they weren't disclosing more. Then you can start to believe that about yourself. Like, Oh, look at the house, how sinful I am. Look at how many things are on the list. And you didn't realize how much of the social dynamic was pushing you to disclose these things. But also there's no way of doing reality testing in that moment to to have someone, I wish someone could just jump in and go, hey, y'all, that's all normal. That's all okay. doesn't mean you're a bad person. It means you're a human being. So can we just kind of take that all off the list and give you a clean slate? But that there's nobody there to do that for you. No. And when it really comes down to it, that whole process of the sin study and your sin list is to expose your vulnerabilities, to expose the things you truly care about, the things you love, and to tell you that those are the things that are going to prevent you from truly following Jesus. That's the goal. Everyone's sin study is very different. There's a process. But the goal is to find your weak spot, the thing that we can use, your vulnerability that we can pull out of you and manipulate. And once we have that, we have you. That's what it is. That's why it's so all over the place and so intense and you're digging and you're forcing a person to come up with something to believe about themselves. They'll have you brainwashing yourself after a while. Yes, yes. So interesting. I did a video one time with someone who had been in Scientology and it was all about how when you're in a cult, they get you to gaslight yourself. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And you're just, it's like hard to get out from under that, you know, make sense of things. Okay. So I want to be able to move to, there's so much we could talk about. I want to be able to move to, you know, how you guys got out, but then to do a retro move after that to your upbringing and what was similar and what kind of, you know, made you vulnerable or open um, to some of the messaging in the group. So um, for you, Nikita, what was, what was the catalyst for you finally leaving? The pandemic? (laughs) I think that was it for our whole group. We came together as a book club to read this book called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality um, because we were all kind of questioning things. And, And that came because we were not so busy anymore. We did not have to go to Bible talk and we did not have to go to individual Bible studies to try to convert people. And I remember there was a a women's event coming up in March of 2020. And I was so grateful. I think it was one or two weeks before mine was scheduled that it was postponed, of course, indefinitely, but I was so relieved because I didn't want to go. Um, and so, so you go from all these meetings multiple times a week to now I can just go to work and I can go home and I can spend time with my family and I can think and I can reflect. And instead of just go, 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 show up, do the things, say the things, go home. And you're just a robot. You're a robot. And they keep you busy so you don't have time to wake up. And actually, there's a woman, uh, Trish, Trisha Hersey. She has a whole platform called the Nap Ministry. And she talks about how so many of us, we can't really wake up because we're not sleeping enough. We're not resting enough. Yeah. Yeah. But when you do rest more, yeah. you can see what's going on in your life. And she has this whole pushback against capitalism and pr- overproducing and all of that. But anyway... It was that being able to slow down and say, I don't like when that person talks to me like this. <laughs> or, you know what? Church has been really boring for a long time. I think I would feel more connected with my spirit if I stayed home instead of having to show up and, and put on a show or something about this doesn't seem right to me. So that along with, you know, there was a whole social justice movement 
of, of 2020 with Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, and especially being a Black woman in the organization. We have a couple of videos that talks about this at length as well. But coming from a narcissistic mother, being the head of my household, I was used to being told I needed to be more. I needed to be different. I wasn't good enough. I need to do this. I need to do this. I need to change this. I need to change that. But I think what helped me to snap out of it even more was no matter what I do or how I try to repent, Mm -hmm. I can't change the color of my skin or the color of my husband or son's skin. And to see the continued lack of compassion or sensitivity. So now you're getting into this is Christian nationalism, where it's a lot of times in these diverse spaces, which the ICOC often in some spaces gets credit for being very diverse in terms of there are lots of people from different backgrounds there. But the leaders are overwhelmingly white. And so there was all this pushback. They didn't feel like there needed to be an address for the black and brown members who were hurting. That's not spiritual. Your eyes are set on this world and not on things above. Don't be divisive. Don't be antagonistic and things of that nature. And so I think that spurred even more of like, I thought we were family. Right, right. The pandemic has been, of course, horrible, caused a lot of, deaths, a lot of loss in so many ways. And at the same time, it has given people this natural break and escape uh, from situations. There are people who felt that they were saved because they had been in a different country or their abusive spouse was somewhere and somewhere else and couldn't get back home. And it gave them the time to pack up their stuff and get you know, it's it's been very interesting, although abuse levels have been higher that people have been stuck at home and the pressure of it, unfortunately. But still, in some situations, it has given people that break. And something that I tell a lot of people who are really wondering if something is okay or not is I will say just if you can, I mean, if you're in an environment where you're being watched all the time, see if you can even just go out for an hour and just go for a walk, sit under a tree, just do something and just be out of that so that your ears aren't ringing. So your heart stops racing so that you get to think a little bit and wonder, do you want to go back? And is it safe really emotionally, spiritually to be there? I'm so glad that you were able to have that break and, and notice it and probably notice a lot of the irony. Like here you were being told that you were you had selfish ambition, but really, the, I mean, the leadership of most cults are the ones who exhibit and embody selfish ambition. They just don't want you to have it, I think, because they don't want you to hold on to your cash or whatever, or be stronger than them at any given time. So it's very interesting what you get accused of and what you get warned about not being. Usually those are the things that the leader is and does. So for you, Asha, what was the turning point? What prompted you to leave? It was, it had been a process for quite a while, but ultimately same thing, pandemic, being able to slow down and think was huge. I had actually, that fall before the pandemic, I had went to something called the Global Leadership Conference. You know, it's another uh, event put on by church people, but they also have secular people speaking. It's something people at my job go to. And they had Henry Cloud there. And he's the guy who wrote the book about boundaries. And he was talking about how churches are supposed to heal people, but they actually cause more mental illness than just about anything out there. And he expressed um, a big part of why is because they control people's lives, you know, and they tell you what to do. It's like having someone else at the steering wheel of a car you're driving. Mm. It causes anxiety, depression, panic. And I was floored. Because him saying someone else is at the wheel of your life. I'm like, that's how I am living and what I've been taught is righteousness. So that was like step one. And it was actually, a. I was talking to some of my friends about this because I had another friend who was in the process of leaving. And of course, she was talking to me and another friend because she was so afraid that we wouldn't be her friend anymore, right? And I was like, I'm not going to be like the rest of the people in this organization. Me and you will always be friends. But speaking with her was helping me 
And one other girl in this group suggested the book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And that's how I had started reading it. And then my friend Rebecca was like, we're going to do this book club. So we all started slowing down and looking at this book. But ultimately, for me, the pandemic was an extreme time of fear because I have respiratory issues already. A common cold will give me pneumonia. So I was like, I've had pneumonia twice as an adult already. I'm only 42. And I know what that feels like. And the only thing that gives me comfort is knowing that my antibiotics are going to work. But with this new, you know, virus, I could suffocate to death. So I'm literally thinking about this. I could die in this thing. And I have two small children and a husband. And, you know, I'm very concerned. And this church's concern is making sure you still meet with people, <laughs> making sure you still are connected. And it's, they started to sound literally frantic, you know, with these Zoom meetings and stuff and make sure you're still getting, make sure this. And it was like, can we just breathe? People are dying. There are people in this organization who were in the ICU. They're like, so-and-so is in the ICU. Yeah, they're on oxygen. Make sure you meet. Because I feel like at that moment, they understood the power of keeping us busy and connected. And they started getting scared when it wasn't happening. And that's when my eyes started opening. Like, you don't seem to care about us. <laughs> like, literally surviving. You just want to keep us together. So we're constantly brainwashing each other, continuing to keep each other brainwashed. And because I was afraid of death, I started thinking, well, when I die, am I even going to go to heaven? Because one thing this organization does is they teach you that we are the only true Christians. We know the way to get to heaven, but also they dangle it. You know, if you're not acting right, <laughs> it's like this thing you constantly have to work towards. So it's like there is a safety net, but we're not sure it's going to be there for you. It depends on, you know, how we feel about you this week. <laughs> I was supposed to be certain of my salvation, but I'm very, very unsure. And when I started thinking about like, well, how do I know? The list I created in my head was all things that my leaders would find acceptable, not necessarily what the Bible says. So it gave me that time to evaluate myself, like, wait a minute. <laughs> and I thought about the scripture where Jesus is telling people, I never knew you. And they're like, but we, we, you taught in our streets and we ate with you, you know? And he's like, I never knew you. And I was like, I think that's me. I think I'm more concerned about these leaders than actually a relationship with God. And that's when I started to wake up. So Asha has said a couple of times about how this church will say that we are the only true church. And I know I alluded to earlier that they will jump through hoops on fire to discredit anybody who speaks out against them. So I just wanted to add a little yeah. footnote that technically they will say that, no, we don't believe we're the only true church. However, 99% of the time, if you want to date someone who's not a member of the church, they will heavily discourage you from it, or they will ask you 101 questions, and this new significant other will have to go through the ICOC Bible study series to make sure that they check out and they have quote-unquote sound doctrine. Or if you want to visit another church, especially as a young member or someone who's on the struggling list, they will ask you, or they'll say, this church, it could be totally fine, but we know our church is fine. And so with you building your faith, do you want to take the chance of maybe going somewhere that will not feed you spiritually? Or if you believe you're a Christian and you come to this church and, and want to place me membership, they will love bomb you and try to make it seem like everything's all good. And then it's, well, let's just have a conversation and look over some scriptures to make sure we're on the same page. Yeah. And then it turns into most likely trying to convince you that you're actually not a Christian yeah. or a disciple, unless you check all of these miraculous boxes, which once people become members of the ICOC, they're probably not even living up to anymore. But I did just want to add that caveat because again, they will try to discredit Yes. any material someone comes across. So I will say, no, they will probably tell you, we don't believe we're the only true church, mm -hmm. but they're 
actions say very much different. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. It is so manipulative. And then they can say, we never said that. And, uh, but they said it, they said it in so many ways. Definitely. Uh, Yeah. Right. How interesting. Right. Yeah. Asha, you were going to say. I was going to say that's kind of an update too. When I studied in 1999, they actually said it and they never, (laughs) they never really got on that pulpit pulpit and said otherwise. I was speaking with someone who used to be head leader over like a whole country (laughs) um, with an elder in training who they left, they walked away and she, she brought this up. She was like, you know, we did teach that. And I remember going to an elder not too long ago, a couple of years ago and saying, why don't we actually officially denounce it? We've never denounced it. And this elder said, well, if we denounce it, people will just start doing what they want. They absolutely know what they're doing. First of all, they don't believe. They do believe that they are the only church. And they will, if you go to them individually, they will say, we don't teach that anymore, but they will not denounce it. They refuse because they understand the hold they have on people. Incredible. Right. Okay. So let's see if we can go to having narcissistic mothers. And it might feel to the listener that we just leapt to something else, but we didn't. We really didn't. So much of what you're talking about, about not knowing who you are, having someone else define you and tell you what's important, tell you how you should be living your life. I think also being kind of in a situation where you can't just feel like you're just on solid ground, that either you're being pushed up or pushed down, you can be demoted really easily with a narcissistic parent. Also with a narcissistic parent, they'll say things without saying them a lot of the time, and they'll be able to say, I never said that, but they said that. So, okay. So Nikita, let's start with you, with your mom and some of the kind of fundamental things that made an impact on you that then kind of led you into having a life in a cultic group where you thought, oh, I know this. I know this world. And I also know how to play a part in this play. So what was it like with your mom growing up? Oh, honestly, the only word that come, flashes across my head is hell. <laughs> it was terrible. I have a very young memory. I think I was maybe six. And I was outside playing with my father and little sister and my mom shouted for me from inside the house and I froze in terror. I did not want to go in the house. And she called for me like one or two more times. She sounded absolutely livid. Um, And I start, you know, my father prompted for me to go in and I start slowly heading to my doom. And I just remember hearing my father say under his breath, it's not right for a child to be so afraid of their mother. And I remember that from a a very young, young age. And so, um, yeah, I I was terrified of her. I have a a young son now and I'm just amazed every time he wraps himself around my legs or crawls into my lap without asking me because I I did not even feel comfortable touching my mother. So gaslighting to no end. I didn't say that, Nikita. You're just being sensitive. Nobody's trying to hurt your feelings body shaming, um, to an extreme sense, like she would, as you know, so especially in the nineties and early two thousands, maybe even the eighties, I think very common. A lot of our parents were heavy into diet culture, but my mom would take it to another level, adding shame and say, go look in the mirror, Mm -hmm. go look in the mirror at how fat and sloppy you look. And then I guess she would see I was defeated. And so her apology would be like body spray. (laughs) So like, here, let's go to the mall and buy me something. Lots of, mm, I don't, I don't know the word for it necessarily, but again, remember I was, I was very high achieving in school. So I was student body president. I was winning oratory contests starting in middle school In middle school. I, I wrote a whole play that my school performed um, in middle school. And I was doing all of these things. And then my mom would say, if I didn't wash the dishes, I don't know who you think you are. I don't know why you think you can lead or anybody should be listening to you. It starts at home. You can't even take care of the things you need to do at home. I don't know why you think you can go to school and put on for everybody. So like 
those kinds of things. And it, it's kind of hard to, to sum it up so briefly, you know, but she was just really an enemy, but then always they hoover. So when they can sense that you're going away mm. or that you're, you're starting to catch on and you're really putting up boundaries, then it's, oh, I can be really sweet for like two weeks. Yeah. And l- let's go to the movies. Nikita, let's, let me make your meal. Let's get our nails done. And so then of course, cause I'm young and I, I want a relationship with my mom. I start to dare to hope that maybe things could be changing. And then right when I'm back where she wants me, she removes the affection again and shuts me down again. And so when I meet this organization, I move away. I grew up in South Carolina. I went to school in Virginia, college in Virginia. And this group, they are love bombing me. It is, I love you. Let's be best friends. Oh, do you need someone to go to the calf with you? Or an older woman was also a doctor leading the campus ministry, was kind of overseeing that. And she shows up to my Bible study and says, I've been praying for you. I've never met her. And the first thing she says, I've been praying for you. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so nice. We still have a very casual, not now, but at the time, had a very casual relationship. When I went home for the summer, she calls me to check in on me to make sure I'm not going astray is what I know now. Because a lot of times when people get baptized and kind of initiated, when they go home for Christmas or when they go home for summer, they have that break. And the family hears all of the things that have been going on and, you know, they plant seeds of doubt. And so little did she know, she didn't have to worry about that with my family, (laughs) but she's calling to keep tabs. And when we get off the phone, she says, all right, I love you. My old mom didn't tell me she loved me. So I was like a melted puddle. So once they've convinced me, they love me and they're kinder to me than my mom. So when they start critiquing me and breaking me down and manipulating me, it's because they care about me. An enemy multiplies kisses, but wounds from a friend can be trusted. Um, Iron sharpens iron. No discipline feels good at the time, but God disciplines those he loves. You want your faith to be refined by fire. Oh, another one. Uh, Something about like, eventually people will only want to hear what their itching ears want to hear. So, you know, if someone's being nice to you, you'd listen to that only because that's what you want to hear. You want to hear that you can make your own decisions. Yeah. So, you know, we were talking earlier about reclaiming our our power and I, our identity. But what's really sad is for Asha and I, those couple of months when we went to college and maybe the end of senior year of high school, we were just starting yeah. to discover who we were. And as we were just starting to blossom into that, it got snatched away because we didn't have that growing up. Mm -hmm. So it's like we had this short window of being away from our moms. And then here comes the ICOC to be like, never mind. Oh, it's a terrible thing. And just for people listening who couldn't see what I saw, you know, Nikita, as you were quoting, Asha was mouthing. Like you both had these quotes just rummaging through your minds, right? And you still know them. I'm sure they were repeated often. So you know them by heart. Okay. Very interesting about the bait and switch also that that's going to happen too with the parent that you talked about. The I'm going to kind of be a good or loving or something parent. That's not so bad. And I'm going to snag you. And then you know, I'm going to reveal my true self again. And just that roller coaster, you were used to that. And that happened in the group too. Okay. And so for you, Asha, what were, what were your memories of growing up with your mom and then the similarities in the group? Um, I think the message I received overall growing up was you do not matter. You just don't. And if you start to think you matter, if you start to speak your needs, if you act disgruntled over anything, I am going to break you down and make sure that you understand that you're lucky to even exist. And what you should be concerned about is me making sure that I am happy. I feel like my whole childhood was trying to get out in front of my parents 
make smooth paths for them so that they would like me today. Um, I was always a disappointment. Mm-hmm. I never did anything right. And I was always selfish. Mm-hmm. That constant berating of being selfish and self-centered kept me on this hamster wheel of productivity, kept me on the hamster wheel of trying to prove I wasn't. I felt like as a child, I was always on trial, constantly on trial. And it still hasn't ended. I mean, my parent is still alive. I am no contact, but it's just it's still the constant narrative. Lots and lots of triangulation, making sure that they look good <laughs> and that they tell the whole world how terrible I am. So it was very, very lonely, you know. Um and so, of course, that falls into this organization. Their, their biggest thing is deny yourself. You are nothing, right? You are here to serve God. No selfish ambition. You know, in Philippians, think of others as better than yourself. Christ considered himself nothing. You are nothing. So it's the same rhetoric. But at least that's how I'm doing it for Jesus. And, you know... <laughs> And I can get that approval, I think. Um, <laughs> and I'll go to heaven, you I know. Think. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might. And so it will all be worth it in the end, you know. So it's the same thing. I'm very much a person who is introverted. I like my alone time, which is a huge no-no in a cult. Mm-hmm. Definitely this one. So that was always considered selfishness always accused of being selfish, self-centered, you're so self-focused. And it's like, I just need to breathe. I cannot just go 24-7. You know, I'm not that personality. I can't just go 24-7 serving people, serving people. But we did. I ran myself ragged for this organization. And the only thing I got was, you need to be doing more. The anxiety that I felt all day, every day. Because You could be making every effort. If you're sitting here eating lunch, are you making every effort? (laughs) If you're lying here in the hospital bed sick, you better be sharing your faith with the nurses and doctors. There is no time to rest. How could you? It just was high stress, high anxiety 24-7. So many people have in this organization have these unexplainable autoimmune conditions that no one knows where it comes from. I know where it comes from. The body always keeps score, especially in the women. There's a lot in the women. Um, Just sick. We're sick. We have depression. Everyone's on Zoloft, you know, and it is because of this system. I say everyone. Obviously, it's not everyone, everybody listening, but, you know, a lot. (laughs) And, um, It's just tough. Right. Wow. You know, there are some people who are not able, in terms of their wiring, to be able to be a parent. I can't say this personally to any one person who I haven't met, but there's some people who have no business taking that on and taking on someone else's heart and soul and and needing to be a caretaker and needing to be selfless for them because they're just not equipped. You know, then you have these children who are the walking wounded from that. And I'm so sorry that you both went through that. And I think, Asha, you know, for you to suddenly feel like you matter, I'm sure it felt really, really, really good and really important. And I hope that you surround yourself now with people who reinforce that that message because everyone matters. And anyone who tells you otherwise is really um, being a thief in your life in terms of confidence and love and all of that. I mean, a lot was stolen from you as children that I think you thought you were being gifted back in this group only to have it stolen again. So I guess just as we're finishing up, it's a good cautionary tale to know that if there are things that you haven't gotten when you're young, there are other people who can seem like they're offering you something for the first time and it feels so good. And so then you might not question right? Take your time and look into it because it just feels so good. It's like being deprived of air and suddenly someone says here and they're offering you air to breathe. It's like, or if you're thirsty and you're being given water, like, thank you. You're not going to ask where to come from. What are, right? What are the strings attached to this? What do I owe you in return? You're just like, thank you so much. So thank you. Thank you to both of you. And where can people find your YouTube channel? 
So if you search my name, Nikita Lambert, that's where the series is. You'll also find, you know, other videos surrounding assertive communication and what it's like to have a narcissistic parent. Um, But there is a playlist called the ICOC series. And so you'll just search Nikita Lambert ICOC series. Also, I'm on TikTok and Instagram. And my handle is just my name at Nikita Lambert. Uh, you know, I am a validation coach. And so for people who are needing that level of validation, you know, and I do make sure to let people know I am not a therapist. (laughs) I am not, but sometimes we just need someone to listen and say, that should not have happened to you. I am sorry. And you know, you're not a sin, you're not in sin and you're not selfish and you're not evil and you're not mean. And, you know, so I offer those services. You can find that on my website, which is Nikita Lambert.com. I try to keep it very streamlined (laughs) so you can find me everywhere. And, and yeah, that's where I'm at. Awesome. Awesome. And Asha for you, same that people can find you on YouTube or anywhere else. Yeah, so the ICOC series, I'm just joining the ride with Nikita. So it's on her YouTube. My Instagram has nothing. I've I've swiped it clean, my personal one since leaving the call, but I do have um an Instagram called Joyfully Paperless. One of the things I did to try to find myself was uh, start to journal and plan. And that's become a hobby. I've never had a hobby before. So if you're into digital journaling and planning, you can find me at Joyfully Paperless. Thank you so much to both of you. This was an honor and a treat. I hope to be able to talk to you again. There's so much more to talk about, but I really wish both of you well. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. One more thing before you go. I am so happy to have had a chance to speak with Nikita and to speak with Asha. It is very powerful when you see that there is often an overlay between childhood issues, childhood experiences, and what people experience when they're older and what they're open to, what they've been conditioned to accept, or what they've been conditioned to need because they didn't get. When they talk about having a narcissistic mother, I know that there are a lot of people who might think that that feels like a bit of a sexist focus just to talk about narcissistic mothers. And so I want to be careful because sometimes people might hear something and what I say in the podcast, as I mentioned before, that there is just as much of an instance of having a narcissistic father. And so the after effects can be very similar, sometimes a bit different, but either way, you get kudos for making them look good. And it's hard for you then to know who you are. It's hard for you to know how you are supposed to be developing and what's okay to be, and it's okay to be different, and it's okay to do your own thing. It's also okay to not be perfect. It's also okay to not be a perfect reflection of the parent as the parent wants to be seen. That's not your job as a child, but it can feel that way, having a narcissistic parent. Then getting involved in a cultic system where you are also supposed to make the leader look good, make the group look good, make the whole organization and or religion look good. But it really shouldn't ever be your responsibility to hold that. It should be their responsibility to fulfill your life in some way and make it feel good and right and to make you feel accepted. Asha talked about the weaponization of acceptance within this group. I love that phrase. Because yes, it is often weaponized. It's weaponized also when you have a narcissistic parent, when you have a narcissistic partner, where you are threatened with shunning, with disconnection, with rejection, if you don't do as you should, if you don't reflect well on them. And again, that's a very unfair burden. You don't really get to be yourself. But It is one of these things that causes so much behavior modification. It really keeps people in line when they think that they're going to be really ostracized from a community and everything you now know to be your 
quote unquote true family and your true group of friends or your true religion or your true calling is going to be taken away from you if you break any of the rules or if you just take a moment to rest and you're not keeping up with the level of responsibility that you've been given and the amount of tasks that are usually a superhuman list of tasks to achieve in a short amount of time, you're always worried that you're no longer going to be accepted. And it's very easy to get demoted within a cultic system. It's very easy to be demoted within a family system where there is someone who is very strict with you about how you're supposed to be. And the way you're supposed to be is exactly as they tell you to be, not the way you were really often intended to be. It's a wonderful thing, actually, that people experience when they come out of groups like this and they find that the world outside is a much more accepting place. Actually, they don't have to worry about rejection nearly as much as people within these groups where they are love-bombed, where they are just showered with so much love and affection so they think they've reached this sort of nirvana. When you also are raised with a parent who is self-focused, as a narcissistic parent often is, then you really find that you are lacking being love-bombed. You're lacking having that kind of focus on you. And so if that has been your experience, I want you to be very cautious when you find yourself in a new relationship or in a new organization you can very easily be swayed to think that this is the best thing ever just because it's filling that space, that gap, that part that you have been thirsty for, the need for attention, the need for acceptance, the need for love. So know that if you feel that right away and it feels amazing like a drug, take a step back. I know this is asking a lot of you because it's going to be very hard to do because it really does release so many good feeling chemicals in your brain. But do take that step away and say, is this real? And you'll know it's real if it's something that lasts over time. If it is just to get you enamored with the group and with them, and if it's just to draw you in, it's not something that's going to last. In fact, you'll find that you're going to be sort of raised up and love bombed and then just as easily drop kicked and pushed out and so you want to notice how the group operates and you want to notice how the leader operates. If they are loving and kind, they're going to be that way consistently. If they are accepting, they'll be that way consistently. But if you notice that some people are getting pushed out and demoted and punished and ostracized right in front of you, know that it's only a matter of time before that happens to you. I want you to be in a situation where it's safe where there is consistency in the way that you're treated and you're not, quote unquote, love bombed just to get your devotion because that's wrong to do. Love should never be used in that way, should never be weaponized, just like acceptance should never be weaponized. Stay safe out there. Talk to you next week. Thank you very much for listening. Please support Indoctrination on Patreon at patreon.com slash indoctrination. Be sure to give us a follow on our social media. Find us on Facebook and Instagram using at Indoctrination Podcast. And for Twitter, find us at at underscore Indoctrination. We love hearing from you too. So send us an email at indoctrinationshow at gmail.com. And for more updates on the show, visit our website at www dot podpage dot com forward slash indoctrination.